Thank you, young man. I appreciate that. Turn your Bibles to Bible. First Corinthians chapter 1. And I just want to take a moment, if I can, and uh, review a little bit of Corinthians. You know a little bit about it, I'm sure, if you've been around the Word of God at all. Uh, Corinthian, the church in Corinth was a mess uh, when the Apostle Paul was writing the first and second epistle. Um, and this was really a difficult time. Paul had started this church. He had come uh, to really love the people there, but what he got back as feedback was something that was a little less than ideal. Uh, let me give you a little background here. Corinth was a very a pivotal part in the, uh, well, the Asia Minor um, peninsula there. It, it was a uh, very prosperous town. As a matter of fact, uh, the Corinthian brass was very much coveted at the time. Uh, they had a way of finishing buildings there. The architecture was amazing. As a matter of fact, uh, now if you see a column and at the top there's a specific kind of decoration, it would be called a Corinthian style. Uh, but, but they had a way of architecture there and the finish that they would put on these buildings when the sun hits it, it would make it look like it was gleaming gold. And it was a thriving city. It was just an amazing, amazing city. But with that came all the corruption and defilement of the world. And you can imagine, uh, this is where the Stoics and the Epicureans had their centers of religious thought. There was a lot of man's wisdom that was perpetuated there. As a matter of fact, they would gloat and glory in this. Uh, the Greeks um, were, were big at the, the man's wisdom type of a deal. And, and uh, the Corinthian uh, city was the, the epicenter, really, of this uh, thought and, and philosophy. Uh, there was a lot of religious background. There were five major gods that were worshipped there. One of them, obviously, Princess uh, Goddess Diana, which uh, had a temple there, as well as in Ephesus, but she was worshipped here. There was other uh, very pagan, other pagan gods that were just worshipped in a very, very wicked way. Um, for the sake of being appropriate tonight, you got to be understanding that the, the immorality was part of the cultural fabric of that city. Uh, idol worship was rampant. Uh, this was just as carnal, as wicked as you can be. And I, I, you can get a sense for this even today. If you were to travel in some of these cities of uh, the Roman Empire, you get a sense for the wickedness that, that pervaded uh, that particular culture. And it was out of this culture that many people were saved that Paul dealt with. And as a matter of fact, it was amazing what God did in the lives of these believers in Corinth. Drew them out of some of this the background and, and these things that they were involved in. <clears throat> and God gave them new life. Um, but as they were learning, they brought into the church much of the things that they had come from. And the things that they had been saved out of, they had not yet been completely uh, devoid of in their life, and, and it followed them into the church. And so, really what we find is this was a church that was defiled in many ways. There was sexual immorality, uh, there was drunkenness, the Bible says, uh, there was perversion of, of all sorts of things within the church. I can't even imagine. But that's the kind of thing that they dealt with. They used the grace of God as a license. In other words, they, they said, well, I've got the grace of God, so therefore I have freedom really to live how I want. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the idea is there that God's grace, if it's sufficient, then it's sufficient for me, even in my sin. And I, we see this resurgence today, even in our culture. Let me just tell you what happens. Uh, there's a lot of this um, philosophy that has pervaded the last generation or two that says, uh, well, this is just me and all of my weakness. You know, accept me or not, this is who I am. And they embrace the uh, wickedness of our lives as though it's excusable. Now, again, I'm not saying that we're anybody perfect because we can't be. But I am saying that we, neither do we need to embrace our wickedness or embrace our weaknesses as something that is our identity. Because our identity is in Christ. And we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yes, we fail. Yes, we fall short. Yes, we are weak. But our identity is in Christ. We are new creatures. And so I don't want us to fall into that philosophy of today. And, and mostly it's in the world. But in Christianity, you know, it really has pervaded our church. Churches in the sense of 
you know, this grace that I have is enough to cover, you know, all of my weakness. I'm just going to continue walking in my weakness and my failure. And that's not right. That's not God's plan. And uh, we want to grow and understand that. So these are the defilements that they had, but they were also divided church, weren't they? There were four distinct factions within the church. There was a faction that followed Paul and said, I'm of Paul. And, there's an, and of course, he was the founder of the church. So why not, right? I mean, that's, we're loyal to the end. You know, you've got those old timers that are just loyal to the founder. And we're going to follow him to the end. And then you've got those that are of Apollos. Now, Apollos was the guy that followed Paul as the pastor of Corinth. And Apollos was a very eloquent speaker. He was, he was well capable. Unlike the Apostle Paul, it was kind of, you know, you get the idea that Apostle Paul was just kind of this rough-edged guy that just kind of, you know, blurted it out there. And, and, you know, he said what he thought. And, you know, it, God just used him in a mighty way to win these rough people to the Lord. And then you get Apollos who comes. He's saved. And he's, he's well-oiled. I mean, he's an he's a eloquent machine. And he can just talk the ears off anybody. And, and uh, you know, some say, well, I'm of Apollos. You know, I love Apollos. He's my leader. He's my guy. I'm following him. And then some say, well, I'm of Peter. Well, this was probably the Jewish component of, of the, the Corinthians because Peter was the apostle to the Jews. And even though we don't have any record of Peter going to Corinth, uh, we know that they probably knew about Peter. I mean, after all, he was the one that saw Jesus, right? He was the one that saw him crucified and resurrected. He was the guy at Pentecost that God filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. And, and he's the Jewish representative. And so we're of Peter. We're of Cephas, he said. And uh, others who were the more sanctified ones said, we are of Christ. We don't follow those. We're of Christ. Well, in their own way, they were being divisive, weren't they? You know, and, and uh, so there was this faction, these dividing uh, components of the church of Corinth. So they were defiled, they were divided, and then I think really also they were disgraced. They were a church that were uh, known for hindering the progress of the gospel in their, in their town. In other words, Paul says, listen, your testimony is not good right now. And uh, there's a lot of things that we need to deal with. And I'm grateful for this, the, the books of First and Second Corinthians. It's amazing to me the doctrine that is taught within these two books. We could go through and talk about the resurrection. We could talk about uh, tongues. We could talk about the church. We can talk about the second coming of the Lord. Uh, we, uh, it just goes on and on and on and on. And these major doctrines of the Bible were given to us because Paul was writing to this broken church that needed help. And so this philosophical city, though, Corinth, had, as I mentioned before, there were a lot of things that had crept into the church. And one of these things was this philosophical bent towards man's wisdom in trying to perpetuate God's work. May I tell you tonight, church, that it is absolutely futile for us in any way to try to use man's wisdom to do God's work. Because man's wisdom is, is finite, it is broken, and it cannot accomplish the work of God. There were many teachers in Corinth that would promote their ideas. They would propagate their th philosophies and ideas. And this approach to teaching, using philosophy and wisdom to try to get your opinions and your, and your teachings across to mankind, came into the church in such a way that they tried to apply it in the use of the gospel. What they, used to, what they would say is that, you know, because this person would be uh, wise and it would seem like they would have this kind of inroads into this understanding that they would be the one teaching and, you know, they would obviously begin to teach false things. And here's the problem with that. They would trade the, the message and what God wanted, the purity of the gospel, for their, their wisdom that they would fall. And so what happens is they would begin to follow these ideologies they would begin to follow these men's teachings and not follow the Word of God. And I think what we see, we see this today even. We see that mankind, or, uh, especially churches, can be divided into what particular train or, or school of thought that you subscribe to. And, and you know, it could be, you know, uh, new evangelicalism, or it, it could be something, uh, reformed theology, and there's all, all kinds of branches of these thoughts of man's wisdom that we get involved in, and what happens is we begin to follow the man's thinking and wisdom and not the things of God. And all of these things would pr profess to be God's wisdom, but instead they are just counterfeits for those things. And that's what was happening in Corinth. And it caused a faction, it caused, it caused division and disgrace. 
And so this church was, you know, bless their heart, it was just, it was a mess. And uh, we're going to find out as we march through this a little bit that there was, you know, some very specific sins that God dealt with uh, through Paul and called attention to. But tonight, I think just by way of introduction uh, of this book, I believe it's important for us to understand, like Paul was giving Corinth, the Corinthian believers, their identity. He was giving them the, the focus again on what their identity ought to be. And tonight, I, I don't sense that, you know, we're anything like the church in Corinth, but may I say tonight that many times we're not the good judge of that. I love our church. I'm thankful for our people. I feel like we've got the best church in the world. I think God's doing great things, and He wants to do greater things, and I'm grateful for what God's doing. I'm not satisfied, as I always say, but I'm grateful. But may I tell you tonight that my bias may blind me to what maybe is going on, and your bias of our own hearts can be deceitful, and we can miss some of these things. So I think instead of us just resting in the laurels of our confidence of what God's doing, let's let the Word of God be the guide. Let's let the Word of God be the assessor of our life to show us if we're right or wrong. And I believe we can come back to that focus that we need to have as a church, much like the Corinthians, the Corinthians needed to be focused again. And Paul did that in three ways, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He reminded them of their Christian calling. And I believe the, the Christian calling is really, it, it, he gives them three aspects to this. What I'm going to share with you tonight is not new doctrine. Matter of fact, if you're not careful, you're going to say, I've heard that before. And it could be like what I talked about this morning, the platitude, right? The idea that I've heard this so much that it's lost its meaning or its interest in my heart. And we can prejudice ourselves against the Word of God simply because we've heard this before. I want to challenge you tonight that you would not let that happen in your heart. Don't let the Word of God fall void and, and become of none effect in your heart simply because you feel like, I know this already. And so we find in the Scripture, God uses this in a corrective way to remind the, the Corinthians of their Christian calling. And this is exactly what it is that God wants. And, and by the way, when we have problems in a church, when there's division, when there's defilement, when there's disgrace in a local church, may I tell you the best thing that we can do as a local church is get back to the focus of what God's called us to do. It's like kids that are bored. Have you ever got kids that are bored? Bored kids always get in trouble, 100% of the time. And let me tell you, churches that have lost their focus, Churches that have lost their method and their, their, uh, what God has called them to do, let me tell you, they get into trouble. And so God wants us to keep back, uh, get back focus of what it is that God's called us to and what He has given to us. So number one, I find in verses 1 through 9, Paul's introduction here, I'm not going to go through it completely. There's a lot of things I could talk about. But, but I see that he, they were, he reminded them that their calling was to be a holy people. And tonight, if I could just remind you tonight, church, that this is the calling that God has placed. Now, something very unique about uh, the book of Corinthians, that is it, it reminds us that it's not just written to the Corinthian believers. The Bible says in verse number one, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Can I pause what I was just going to say about that and say that Sosthenes is a very interesting guy. He was the ruler of the synagogue back in Acts. And evidently, he had given Paul a lot of hard time, but some point, at some point, he'd gotten saved. Isn't that something? The power of the gospel to change the heart of a leader, a religious leader, to now be someone that's not against Paul, but that's actually with him. Matter of fact, many people believe that Sosthenes might have been the scribe that was writing for Paul in 1 Corinthians. I love it. Isn't that awesome? I love those little indications. But notice he says, under the church that is a church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So right away it tells us, listen, Paul was writing this, but he knew very clearly that this wasn't just going to be for the Corinthian church. This was going to be for every church that was going to read it, and it was going to be applicable to every Christian that would read it. And tonight, I want you to put yourself in that position. Paul is sitting in Rome and he is writing to the Corinthian church, and just pretend tonight that he's writing to you. He's writing to us. And, and if it says the church of Corinth, think about the church in Broadview Heights. By the way, every church has two addresses. They're the church at Broadview Heights, but we're the church in Christ. Amen. 
And that's, that's the blessing of the local church tonight. But the Bible says here, uh, verse number three, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace that God has given unto you by Jesus Christ. Notice how many times he uses the term Jesus Christ. You ought to uh, underline that. I've got underlined in my Bible. You think he's trying to point them back to their focus? Continue on, verse number five, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I find there that he reminds them that they are called to be set apart. Did you notice that in verse number 4 and uh, down? The Bible says, God is, God is called, uh, excuse me, always on your behalf, God has given the grace through Jesus Christ that we could be enriched in him and that we can find that, that uh, verse number 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Here's the idea. God called the Corinthians as believers to be separated from their lifestyle. He called them out of that Corinthian lifestyle. I didn't tell you this, but to be called a Corinthian was to the other parts of the world was a negative thing. That was about the lowest uh, you could say. Uh, to Corinthize, Corinthize is the I same, it's, it's a synonym of, of like prostitution and other things. It's just awful. And Paul's saying, listen, you have been set apart. You've been called apart from what you were unto a new identity. And that set apart is a theme that's throughout the New Testament. God has called us. Listen, church, you have been called out of that which you were once associated with. What you once thought, what you once did, what you once identified with, you are no longer identified with that any longer. Listen, I, you may be in the world, you may be a part of the same uh, geographical location, but you have no association, spiritually speaking, with anything that went on in your past life. In other words, the power of the things before are no longer yours. They don't hold sway over you. You're not a slave to them. The sin that you were once identified with, that's no longer your identity. And praise the Lord tonight, we are called to be set apart. Don't forget that. Because when we forget that, what we end up doing is going back to what we were saved out of. And the Bible calls it like a dog returning to his own vomit. Now, it's a terrible picture. But, but we look at our dogs and we pet them and we paint them up and we brush them and we dress them up and they go back and eat their vomit. And I'm just saying as a Christian, we're not, we're, that's not a picture of salvation. A picture of salvation is not just putting on the right things and looking nice and then going back and living like we did. We're changed in our nature. A dog would be a picture of salvation if he no longer acted like a dog. And I, I, I'm just saying, the fact of the matter is God's changed us from within. We're called to be separated and set apart. And I praise the Lord that we uh, at Broadview Heights Baptist Church are in, in a location, but we're in Christ, which has called us out of the world. And that's the idea of this church. The very word church means a called out assembly of believers. May I remind you tonight that our church is not a social event. We're not just a pastime. We're not just something that we do on Sundays and we fill a, pul we fill a, a pew and a, and a pulpit and we go through a little bit of a program. That's not church. Now this is a meeting of our church together and we encourage one another in the Lord. But a church is a called out assembly of believers set apart for the purpose of doing God's will. Witnessing to the lost. That's what we are. Our identity is in Christ. We're set apart. And by the way, I don't want to become just a, 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 a watered-down church. I know, you know, if we, if we changed what we did and changed the flavor and changed a lot of things, we could bring in a lot more people, be a lot more palatable. But I want to tell you, the moment we start compromising what God has called us to do and what our identity is in Christ, we start to compromise our identity as a church. And I don't want to do that. I want God to be glorified in this. We're set apart. We're called for His glory. But not only are we set apart, but we're enriched by His grace. Notice verse number 6, the Bible says, even as the testimony, uh, oh, um, verse 5, excuse me, that in everything we are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Now, this is a tremendous truth in that God not only calls us apart, 
The word enriched means to give everything that is required. All right, I like to think of it as um, packed full to the brim. Uh, maybe uh, you think of enriching something, you're adding something to it that's missing, right? And you're bringing it to its, its capacity or to its potential. And, and that's what God has done for us. May I tell you tonight that as a church, we can look around and say, well, if we just had this, or if we just had this, or if we, and I understand that there are things we want to see God do, but may, I, may you understand tonight that God has given to us everything that we need to accomplish His will, right here. I mean, look around for a minute. Everybody just take a minute, look around. Look to your left, look to your right. If somebody's sleeping, give them a little nudge, okay? Now, we're looking around, and we're like, oh, that's just so-and-so, Right? Or that's just so and so. May I tell you tonight, you're sitting next to someone that God has enabled and enriched to accomplish the work of God in a way that only they can do it. And by the way, someone's looking at you. I, I'm saying tonight, every person has a part. You have a calling. Get involved in the work of the Lord because God has enriched every church, He's enriched every local body of believers, calling them to accomplish what God wants them to accomplish. That's why it's so important we understand that church is not just a, a, a spectator sport. It's not something you just look at and, and observe and enjoy. It's a body. It's an organism that we get involved in and we work and we serve the Lord together because that's His calling for us. You say, well, I don't know if God really called me to do anything. I promise you He did. We're going to learn that in the chapters to come. He's equipped us as a church. You have a gift. You have an opportunity and ability to do it and to serve the Lord. But not only are they set apart and enriched, but notice they're expectant of his return. Verse number seven. So that you come behind to no gift or don't lack in any gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit of a church that is focused on what God is doing is a, is a church that's focused on his coming again. Second Peter chapter three, verse number eight, uh, verse number 11, excuse me. Oh, would you turn over there? Uh, or just listen to me as I read 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Now, he just got done saying that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night, and all the elements are going to be melted with a fervent heat, and the world is going to be burned up, etc. Seeing then, or understanding that all these things shall be dissolved. Okay, that literally is going to happen. There's not going to be anything left that we see today. The works of men's hands, which, by the way, is everything you see, will be dissolved. They will be, they will be burned up. Okay, understanding that is going to be happening. That's a given. There's no question about it. As we understand that that happens then, what manner, what is, what's the motive then, or what's the result of that? What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? A lot of people say, well, if it's, if, if it's just a, a nihilism, I'm not going to be around any longer. Well, I'm just going to live for myself. Well, that's not the spirit of the Christian. The spirit of the Christian is, hey, if everything's going to be burned up and what God says is true, I better be a holy individual. I better be set apart for the Lord. I want my life to be different. That's the motive of the Christian. We understand that there's a motive here as we look and expect for God's return. It changes the way we live. May we ever live in, that, in light of that. When you get up tomorrow morning and you go about your business, whatever you've got to do tomorrow morning, the first thought ought to be, Lord, today can be the day. What if you come today, Lord? And if you carry that thought in your mind from moment to moment, letting it get out of your mind too long, too far, I promise you it'll change the way you live tomorrow. It'll change what you say. It'll change what you do. It'll change how you think because God's coming is imminent. And so they needed to be uh, expectant of His return but finally, they were dependent on his faithfulness. And notice in verse number 8 through 8 and 9, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, your faith is not going to be in vain, but you will have confirmation of that. We talked about that this morning, that we're not going to be disappointed when we get to heaven. Praise the Lord. We're not going to get to heaven and say, oh, wait a minute, I, I live for Jesus for this? Or, you know, I gave up all those things in life that I wanted to do that I thought were fun because of this? No, there's going to be no disappointment in heaven. I said the only, the only thing that we're going to think in heaven, I believe, is, Lord, I wish I would have done more. Now, we understand that concept, but are you living that out in your life? Are you, are you living in light of that reality every day? Church, are you, are you keeping that in mind practically? 
not just theologically. And so the dependence on the faithfulness of God, notice he says, who also will confirm you unto the end, oh, excuse me, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So that dependence on his faithfulness really was the focus of holiness. I said, number one, that Paul reminded them their calling was to be a holy people. Can I just tell you tonight, church, Broadview Heights Baptist Church, our calling is to be a holy people. Not to be a comfortable people, not to be a people that follows convenience or our own thoughts, our own wisdom, but to be holy, set apart for the Lord. That's what God's called us to as a church and individually. Number two, God's uh, called them also into fellowship. Look at verse number 10. It kind of reduces it in verse 9. We're called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. Now he, he goes apart from his talking about the, the, um, the, the introduction now to talking about the divisions that they were facing. That ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Now the word judgment there means estimation of something. In other words, I esteem this to be true, and so do you. All right, so this is the estimation that we have in our heart about what it is that God is, or what is right, and what we ought to be following. For it hath been declared unto me of you by my, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? I don't know who this house of Chloe was, but they were, they were snitchers. <laughs> now, I suspect that Chloe and her house were members of the church in Corinth. And I suspect that they wanted to do what was right, or at least they saw what was going on, and they had an inkling. I don't think this is what Paul meant when he left us to serve the Lord. And so you know what they did? They went to Paul. Paul, na 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 na. people back at church, they're not acting right. No, that's not what they did. Listen, we're not talking about tattletale. We're not talking about gossip. There are some things in the Bible that are forbidden to talk about. And we ought to be careful what our spirit is. But I'm going to tell you the difference between what Chloe, the house of Chloe did, and what many times Christians do is the spirit by which it's done. What is your motive? You know what I believe tonight? I believe that house of Chloe, whoever this was, really had a love for their church. And they had a desire to see God glorified in it. And they saw that it was not happening. There was wickedness, there was defilement, and, and just all kinds of things going on. And so they wrote to Paul, which, by the way, was their spiritual authority. They didn't go to some other person and gossip. They went to the person that could help. And that's, the good, that's another good indication that you're doing what's right. Number one, your motive is love for that person or that thing. Number two, you go to the person who can actually affect a change in that, has authority over it. And that was the Apostle Paul, the founder of the church, so Paul comes, uh, in, in, in his ears comes this word. There's a problem with the church. Man, it's not doing right. And Paul is hearing that there's divisions and that there's problems there that cause the fellowship to be broken. I'm not going to, I don't want to spoil it, but if you go to chapter 11, I won't go there tonight, but you remember that the, even the Lord's Supper was something that was a dividing thing. The very thing that's supposed to draw people together. What would happen is you'd have some people that would go and, They'd come with a big feast. They'd pack their, basically a hot, hot lunch, you know, potluck dinner. And they'd bring in theirs and they'd have their little group come sit with us and they'd sit at one table and then somebody would be over here and they wouldn't have anything. And they, they just kind of sat there like, I don't know what we're doing here. And, you know, they would be feasting and having a good time and, and uh, these would be starving over here. Paul says, listen, if you're hungry, eat at home. The Lord's table is not for dinner. That's not what this is all about. And there's divisions among you, and there's people that eat, and some that are starving, and it's just a terrible situation. So this division that they heard about, Paul heard about, was something that really troubled him. And so he reminded them that they are called to fellowship. Now, I know that's a trigger word. We laugh as a Baptist church that fellowship equals food, right? And we're, talking, well, we're having a fellowship. Well, that means food, but it really doesn't mean food. The word fellowship is the illustration of entering into the same task or the same event with someone else. You know, you could walk and have fellowship. You can work and have fellowship. 
Um, the, the idea there is accomplishing the same thing. You know what fellowship is to me? Can I tell you what fellowship is to me? Coming in on Saturday morning and seeing all the different ministries that are taking place. Yesterday we had Bible club transportation people that were meeting and workers getting ready. We had somebody in the kitchen making some food for the Bible club. We had a singles ministry event yesterday and Miss Bell came in and she's making stuff and getting it all decorated and ready and we got some people going out and visiting and we've got uh, some people that are going to be working here. We got some people that are practicing music for an upcoming uh, event and uh, yesterday was just a beehive of activity. You know what that I walk in and I'm thinking praise the Lord. You know why? We're all doing the same thing. I mean we're all got our purposes but we're all going the same direction. I'll tell you it's a lot different than coming in on a Saturday and I'm the only person here and I'm studying and, and, you know, and kind of walking around an empty building. And now I'm not saying there's days that are, where there's empty buildings here, but I'm just saying fellowship to me is understanding that no matter where we are, what we're doing, we're all doing the same thing together. You know, I can have fellowship even if I'm not with you because I can remember and understand that when I go and do my thing to, on Monday morning, you're going to go and do your thing on Monday morning, and together we're both serving the Lord if we are serving the Lord. You know what, that's fellow. It gives me encouragement, strength. And I, I just believe tonight that that's what these believers in Corinth forgot about, called into fellowship. They got their eyes off of the message. They got their eyes off of the mission. And they got their eyes on the messenger. And that's the problem oftentimes. We get our eyes on man. May I encourage you, and this may not be uh, beneficial for me as a pastor, although pastors have authority and that sort of thing, we're, we're just men. We, we, we're not lords, we're not dictators. And so when there's a problem, it's good to handle it in the right way, but it's also good to remember, we don't follow man, we follow God. Now, that's not a reason not to follow man, because authority is always, if it's godly authority, and following God, as Paul said, follow me as I follow God. We ought to follow the Lord, but, but ultimately keep our eyes on God and follow Him. Human nature likes to follow that which you can see and that which you can understand. That's why it's so easy for a pastor to become the object of following or leading because people love to follow something that they can see. Especially when you get a pastor who's got a very persuasive personality, kind of a type A guy, and he's just going to be out there and get it all done. People start to look at him. Just tell me what to do, pastor, and I'll do it. Right? And I don't mean by that service. I mean by that conviction and obedience and that's where we get into trouble you start to follow a personality and you don't follow the Lord and this is what was happening in the church Paulus was a teacher and a, a wonderful speaker and Paul was as I mentioned already the founder and all these factions came to be but if you'll notice the call was to unity notice in verse number 12 now this I say every one of you saith I'm a Paul I'm of Apollos I'm of Cephas I'm Christ and then Paul asks the question. He says, is Paul divided? <laughs> Are there many parts of Paul? No. And then he says, uh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Notice he says there, uh, was Paul uh, crucified? No, Paul wasn't crucified. So why are you, uh, and you could put anybody's name in there. Was Apollos crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Apollos? Was Peter baptized, or, uh, were you baptized in the name of Peter, or was he crucified for you? No. So the idea there, is Christ divided? Uh, I'm sorry, I think I said Paul earlier, but is Christ divided? No, you didn't chop Christ up into many parts and you each get a part of him. He's one Lord, one person. And so that we follow one person. And that was where they got divided here. And, and, and I, I like the fact that he said it was Paul crucified for you because we find out a little later on, verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Some people stumble at the cross. They can't get past it. Some people mock the cross, the wisdom of God that was shown in the crucifixion of Christ. But to those of us who believe, hallelujah, it's the power of God. It changes lives. We talked about that with Sosthenes and these Corinthians believers who God said, and I'll tell you, even here tonight, there are testimonies of people who God has miraculously and marvelously changed our lives. Praise the Lord. 
That's the power of the gospel. And Peter, excuse me, Paul is enjoining them to focus back on what the power is. Not the dividing, but the power of God that changed lives and brought the change in them that they needed. And so number two, I said that they were called to fellowship. Number one, I said they're called for, to holiness. But number three, as we close tonight, they were called to glorify God. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says in verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren. And here's where it gets a little bit personal. You see your calling, how that not many wise, excuse me, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And I've spent a little time on this in the past, so I won't belabor this in humiliating us, but if we look around, there's not a whole lot of wise, not a whole lot of nobility here. I know our last name's royalty, but it really doesn't mean anything. My dad used to say that in a cup, not, that in a dollar fifty will get you a cup of coffee because it doesn't mean anything. But here's the point. There's not many noble, not many wise. Now, he didn't say there were none. You know, the, the gospel net is wide for anybody. Kings can get saved, amen? And, and uh, wise men can be saved. Praise the Lord. But they're not many. All right, so what is it then? Well, we continue on. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, he didn't call us foolish in the essence of the word foolish, but we look foolish to the world. In other words, we wouldn't be what the world would choose when they have their idea of success, right, or power, or wisdom. The world's not going to look at us and say, oh, now I know why it succeeds. They're not going to look in church and say, oh, of course this is going to take off. You've got the cream of the crop, man. You've got the best of the best. I, I think the, the God's people are the best people in the world, but let me tell you, this fits us. And we ought to be reveling in that, you know, because there's a reason for this. God has chosen these weak and foolish things to confound the wise and the things that are mighty. And the base things, that is the things that are low, the, the things which are despised, God has chosen. Yea, the things which are not, literally have no value, to bring to naught or to bring to nothing the things that are. Now, it's interesting how God can take something that is nothing and something that is foolish, and he can shine his f wisdom in it, and it sh it's amazing. Isn't that something? He can take us broken earthen vessels and put the power of the gospel in us, and it changes people's lives. Now, that ought to tell us, number one, we are nothing. <laughs> but number two, we are everything with Christ. That's the identity that we have tonight. Believers, can I tell you tonight, you are not a nothing in Christ. We are everything in Christ because it is all of Him and none of us. So number one, remember what we are. I reminded you, there's not many noble, not many wise, not many mighty. But God has chosen the foolish things and the base things and the weak things to confound those things that are wise and mighty. And so... We're called not because of who we are. You're here tonight saved and part of a local church not because of who you are or because of your background or because of your training or because of your position or pedigree or whatever it is, your wealth. It's not because of that, but in spite of that. So whether you have a lot or a little, whether you have much wisdom or no wisdom, whether you have a lot of might or no might, whether you have everything or nothing, it doesn't matter. Because we're not called because of it, we're called in spite of it. And God wants us to remember that. Number one, remember who you are. But number two, remember why we are called. And I read that already. God has chosen these things. Why? So that it can be uh, bring to naught, bring to nothing the wisdom of the world, and it can bring glory to Him. Because if it was of us, it would be like, yeah, if we had the best of the best too, we could do the same thing. We could duplicate that. Let me tell you, you can't duplicate the work of God apart from God. You can't duplicate the, the miracles of changed lives and the, the, power of, the power of the gospel in the hearts of men. You can't duplicate that, humanly speaking. It has to be through the power of God. That's the glory of God, and that's why he was reminding them, listen, the power of God is found in our weakness, in our nothingness. That's where God's power is found. And then he reminds them, lastly, that all that we have 
is in Christ and he is all that we need. Look at these verses. I love them. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are we, are ye in Christ. Now listen to what that just said. But of him are ye in Christ. In other words, he's getting ready to slap on us another identity. You're not you're what you were before. Here's what you are now. God, who, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, someone has called this the phases of our redemption, and uh, each of these words is significant. Righteousness deals with the fact that God once has given us uh, the robes of righteousness, salvation, all right, and he dealt with that before. Then the Bible says in verse number 30 there, he's given to us sanctification and then redemption. So this is the past, the present, and the future. In the past, he gave us our, our righteousness and salvation. In the present, he is sanctifying us. He is making us more like his son, Jesus Christ. And in the future, ultimately, redemption will be ours when we see the Lord Jesus Christ in, in person. Hallelujah. So what, what we have in him is all that we need. Notice in verse number 31 that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The divided, defiled, and disgraced church of Corinth needed to be reminded of who they were and what their calling was. Their calling was to be a holy people, to be a people of fellowship together, unity, and to be a people that glorified the Lord in their weakness. And they were failing. Paul's going to bring some correction, and I trust tonight that as we understand what God has called us to, we're no different than the church in Corinth other than we're the church at Broadview Heights. And I don't mean by that we're in the same sin. I just mean by that it applies the same to us. May God help us that we would not become complacent in this world because too often the world creeps in, the philosophies creep in, the worldliness creeps in, the defilement comes in through our lives, and it really hinders the work of God. May God help us to remember our calling. And church, I'm challenging you as we launch in this study of the book of 1 Corinthians tonight. I, I just want you to remember that God wants to be glorified in our church in this place, and He does it through His people.